Well, thank you so much, everybody. My name is Stephen May, and this is That Show with Mahi. And today I have the gorgeous Anthony Brandon Wong online with me. Uh, he has a career that spans over many of years, but it's one of those careers that you could only dream of. And I think we're all heading in that direction. He's been on every single Aussie channel, uh, <laughs> Channel 10, Channel 9, <laughs> Channel 7, and most recently Family Law with SBS. Uh, you've done a couple of small feature films like The Matrix. Uh, <laughs> you know, there was one with Kate Blanchett, I think, The Little Fish. And also, <laughs> most recently, The Invisible Man. Anthony Brandon Wong, welcome to That Show with Mahi. Lovely to meet you over this format, Mahi Mahi. I'm just thinking of The Fish, Mahi yeah. Mahi. That's right. There's a little secret, apparently, after I've had a couple of drinks, the Mahi Mahi comes out. So That's right. That's we'll talk right. about that another time. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> Well, that's a lovely introduction. Thank you, Stephen. And, and I just think it's so great that you're being so productive during this time and offering our industry some insights from great performers. I, as I said to you just before we started this interview, I did watch your wonderful interview with Rob Mills and um, Ali Calder. And so I just think bravo to you. That's so great that you're doing that. Thank you. And I think this is why I wanted to ha have a chat with you today. Um, it's, I've looked back and gone, what sort of really intrigued me in my career or what sort of given me light bulb moments? And I, what I mean by light bulb moments is that I've, I've learned something new or I've been pushed in another direction. And I remember doing your the first weekend, I've done a couple of classes with you over the two days. And I just remember shifting something in my career or shifting something in my mindset that mm. I needed to achieve more. Uh, and whether that was just because I was coming from different musicals, back-to-back -back musicals, and then getting into a straight piece of theatre, or it was just that I was maturing into a man that needed some more guidance in a different direction. And I think what your approach is, is quite spiritual. It's quite, um, it's actor to actor, but it's also a human being connection, which I think we, mm. we, we perform all the time, but we have lost connection. And it's quite, you know, mm. here we are in this digital world trying to communicate. Mm. But how do we communicate through this? And so what I want to talk to you now about is how are you finding with, A, with your teaching, but also with your acting, to connect via this digital world? Well, this is the new world we're in for now. And um, I was just doing a, um, I, I attended a Zoom event the other day with um, a casting director and she was just saying for the foreseeable future, when we can't be physically in rooms to audition, the Zoom or the Skype or the FaceTime method is the way we're gonna do it. In fact, uh, something very interesting is when I auditioned for the role of Danny Law in the SBS Matchbox Pictures series, The Family Law, I had to do um, a three-way uh, Skype audition. So I was in Sydney at Dave Newman's uh, casting office. And my co-star, uh, Fiona Choi, who played Jenny Law, was in New York City. And the director of the first season, Jonathan Bro, was in Melbourne. And we had to do this weird, and it was a chemistry test. So oh. they were looking to see what my chemistry was like with Fiona. And yet, you know, like even now, as I'm talking to you, Stephen, I'm, 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 where do I look? You know, I'm looking down at your eyes down there but then I've got to look back here so you yeah. you see my eyes so it was really a challenge and and uh so getting used to this zoom medium this skype world where we have to it's awkward but mm -hmm. it can be done and the interesting thing is about my classes which have all moved online out of the classroom has been really a, a, a great surprise to me because I thought I wouldn't be able to get the kind of deep heartfelt vulnerable connected emotional work out of actors you know over this weird medium and it's been fantastic it's been as good well maybe not as good but very very good uh, compared to being in a classroom i mean the only things you can't do is you can't be as physical of course because we're sitting here but but in terms of connecting to the emotions listening to the scene partner being affected by our scene partner, being touched by the material, making choices that connect us emotionally to the material, that's all been just as good as in a physical classroom where we're all together, which has been such a um, surprise to me as yeah. a teacher. Do you think people, um, maybe they feel a bit more comfortable in their own surroundings? Uh, they have their mm. own lounge room. It's their own sort of tactile thing. Yeah. They can kind of, they don't have, they have to turn up 
but they don't have to turn up in a way that they're in a room with other people so much yeah. that they hide behind. Um, maybe that's... Yeah, I think for some people, yes, I think... Um, yeah, I think there's something to be said for that. You are in your comfortable environment. It's familiar and it's almost like you roll out of bed with bed head and you've got your PJs on and you go, you know, rather than here I'm getting, you know, putting on my best outfit and I've got to get in the car or the, on the train and I've got to prepare. And I mean, you still have to prepare if you have to audition on Zoom, but I do think there's something to be said for that, that, that familiarity of the, of the environment. Yeah. Now, mm. um, you, I mean, you say in your, in your workshops that you teach, you know, from it, not one particular person, but you, uh, Ivana Chubbik mm. is, is the main sort of source where you start from, or could you explain yeah. a little bit more than that? I don't want to sort of, um, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I've had more than, I, I think I wrote down a list one time because I was curious to know, I think I've had more than a hundred teachers in voice, wow. acting, audition technique, comedy, um, uh, dance, movement, singing, musical theatre, and those teachers work in very, very different ways. So some work from the imagination, like the work of Stella Adler, some work from the body, like the work of Laban and Michael Chekhov, and some draw a lot from the real life, the actual experiences that have happened to an actor. And Ivana Chubbuck works a lot that way. I think all acting techniques work. I think uh, it's important not to get into a religious war about acting techniques and not to be fundamentalist about it because you can learn from everybody. For me, Ivana's work, who I, I, I first met Ivana Chubbuck in 2005 in LA, uh, when I asked my friend, two-time uh, Tony Award winner Judith Light, uh, who's the best acting teacher? And she said, oh, I think Ivana Chubbuck's wonderful. And she introduced me to Ivana. And there began this amazing journey that's lasted till this very day. So I've been kind of working with Ivana on and off for about 15 years. So, yes, it is a, it is a cornerstone of the way I teach. But I also work with Larry Moss since 2011, every year since 2011. Um, in LA and Melbourne and Sydney with him. And I've also worked with Eric Morris and I've worked with Margie Haber and I studied Strasbourg and for quite a, a while and Meisner technique. So I think they're all beautiful. So I pull in lots of different elements from different people. And I also have invented my own processes and exercises as well. So whatever works for that particular individual beautiful soul uh, yeah. that I'm working with. Um, but yes, Chubbuck is a very strong skeleton of the kind of script analysis process that I do. Yeah. So, I mean, looking at your IMDB or looking at anything up of your list of credentials, mm -hmm. if you're such a successful actor, why teach? I love teaching as much, sometimes even more than acting. I'm just on fire when I teach. I feel like I'm meant to do it. I don't say that with any kind of ego. I just, there are some things in life that I feel when you're doing them, they feel so natural and have such flow yeah. that people might say I'm meant to do that. You know, someone might be a bicyclist, a cyclist or a dancer. And they think, oh, when I'm doing that, I feel more at home than in anything else. And I feel that way when I teach. I love people. I just feel um, it's a great way to give, uh, to make a contribution to other people. Mm -hmm. I get such a kick out of seeing people that I've had the opportunity and the blessing to work with excel and make their dreams come true. You always make me so proud, Stephen, whenever you, I mean, you're just working so much and whenever you get a new job, I just, I'm so proud of you. And, it, and it's nice to think that maybe something, you know, in my class or in a session that we did, or, you know, when I was directing you, maybe something illuminated something for you and you were able to use that in your next audition or next job. So, but I just think for me, it's a way I can directly, I mean, you can make a contribution as an actor, of course you can, but I feel like I really feel that sense of contribution and giving to other people every time that I work with people, either in a private session or directing them on set or um, in a classroom or over Zoom now. Yeah. I mean, you can see all your posts that you do on social media, online, or people giving a testimonial uh, those group shots that you do where everybody, you know, there's the serious one and there's the fun one. You yeah. can see in people's faces. And I, I always comment to them, I always see them because I just know that feeling after two days of working with you or whatever it is now over, you know, six weeks, that, that uh, the time that you give and the understanding of each person, uh, just the understanding of what, how you are teaching now, it's, it is really incredible. And so to anybody that is thinking about it and wants to do it, please 
I would uh, highly recommend getting in there. Oh, thank you, Stephen. I, thank you. It's just, it's, it's such a love fest, you know? It's yeah. like human beings at their best. That's what's so glorious. You know, in a classroom, people are bearing their hearts. They're, they're making themselves incredibly bravely vulnerable. We're getting to see people be the most truthful and authentic and connected and coming from their heart. And who wouldn't want to spend two days in that or six weeks or it's just such a beautiful thing we do. And, and uh, you, you know, we're very lucky that we get to do that. We're very lucky that we go into a room with a group of strangers, initially strangers, yes. who then can become really, really close friends because we reveal so much. And where do you get to do that? A lot of professions you'd know, you wouldn't get necessarily, I think, being a construction worker, although I don't know, I don't think most construction workers turn up on their first day of rehearsal and, and talk about their most painful memory or, you know, it's just, it's, but we do that. We share that kind of intimate information with each other, which has the potential to really open our hearts and create a lot more compassion with each other, which I just think is so beautiful. Absolutely. Uh, I'd like to sort of dive into a couple of um, shows that you've done with Sydney Theatre Company, mm. uh, one being mm. America and the other one, yes. uh, A Cat in a Hot Tin Roof. Now, yes. it couldn't be two completely different plays. Uh, mm. And I remember coming to, I've seen both of them and they're both you know, yes. extraordinary. And Kip Williams has this, you know, a, an, an amazing mindset of, of where he wants his artistic director for STC. And the, the yeah. catalog of shows that people are seeing now are quite incredible. Now, mm. you're on his uh, wish list or the, the gentleman that he wants to work with. How no, does that make so you blessed. feel as, as, a, as an actor to be performing in, say, Trimerica, where, you know, that's what people would probably expect to see you in? Mm. And then on the flip side, mm. a cat in a hot tin roof. Now, yeah. did you expect to be in a show like that or did you ever, in your thoughts, go, you know what, I'd love to be in that show? And, and, yeah, and Kip, you have been. It's on, it's, on, it's on your resume. Well, Kip Williams, who I, you know one of the great angels on this earth. I adore that man. He's just such a wonderfully egalitarian and humanitarian and compassionate and kind and supportive man, as well as being brilliant. Um, he has that vision and Sydney Theatre Company has that vision. I remember talking to Patrick McIntyre, um, who's the company manager there and, and just saying, thank you so much for casting such a diverse array of artists in your in your um, year of shows, and he's and I said thank you. Also, uh, we were t particularly talking about Asian Australian actors and artists, and I said thank you so much for having so many Asian Australian actors in your shows. And he said we're an Asian city, we are part of Asia. Why wouldn't we do that? Yeah. So I loved when he said that, and and whether you think that Australia is an Asian part of Asia or not, but I just love that ethos that why wouldn't you have diversity? because that's the world we live in. That's Sydney, that's, that's our world now. And to yeah. not represent the diversity of who we are just seems 1950s and backwards. So Kip um, cast me in my first Chekhov ever, Three Sisters of the Opera House, and I played Cheba Teakin. And, and then he cast me in my first Tennessee Williams um, and playing Doc Ball opposite Hugo Weaving and beautiful Pamela Rabe. And, and, and so I love that man. I love the fact that he gives, like another example is on, um, Lord, Lord of the Flies. I think, I, correct me if, if I'm wrong, but I think about nine of the 11 actors in that were making their STC debut. So STC, Sydney Theatre Company, is so open to new blood and to diversity. And, um, and I just really applaud that company. I think it is, it is really gone leaps and bounds forward and it's always been a great company, but I remember looking at a retrospective of, there was a book that STC put out, which was showing their plays during the eighties. Yeah. And Peter Carroll and I were in the dressing room going through that uh, retrospective. And there was just so many wonderful productions and actors. But one thing we did notice was most of the actors were Caucasian, almost like 99% of them. And, uh, and now look at us in 2020 and look at productions like White Pearl, which had an almost female Asian Australian cast and, um, you know, productions like, you know, Charles Wu works a lot there and Monica Sayers and Jason Chong, my beautiful yeah. colleagues from Chimerica. So I, I just love it. I love it. We're a changed world. Yeah. And so do you, 
see yourself being more proactive in trying to do that? Um, have you have you sort of pressed it with with directors that you've met that you not necessarily are going to work with, or is that something a part of um, being being an Asian man? Do you feel that you you sort of lead with that, or are you, are you finding yourself just being cast in shows and the diversity is already there, or are you still having to make a point to say, come on, like open, mm. open, open t- take the blinkers off and start thinking mm. wide scope? Like Kip's one man, yes, and that's one company, but mm. What is it that, okay, from, I'll let me re- rephrase it. As a white privileged man, how can I, what, what can I do to lead it that is going to be, because I think I, I've said it before about that it's not, it's, Bene Brown said it, that it's not about the minority speaking up, it's about everybody else around it yeah. that's going to make the difference. Yeah. And I and think, Stephen, you're just such a beautiful human being because even going to see your cabaret show last year at, um, in, in Oxford Street in, um, Claire Salon in yeah. uh, you know and you were the, a theme of your show then was about standing up against violence against women and and so you're a wonderful example of that yes I, I think well to answer your question you can um, become a creator in the sense of a writer yes and you can write roles and and leave it open to which ethnicity plays those roles or write you know, I don't believe in this thing that only um, Asian writers can write about the Asian experience or only gay people can write about the gay experience. I mean, I think there's a great richness for, for, for people to write about their own experience, but I also think there's a great learning for someone to, to cross the so-called divide and write about an experience that might not be their own because they, yeah. then they could learn a lot. And if, as long as they do it with integrity and seek, great counsel on that from people in that community i don't see why you couldn't yeah. you know um i just saw a movie the other night which was very much um about a woman's story but it was directed by men oh and it was actually filmed sorry it was Thelma and louise which i've seen many times before directed by ridley scott mm-hmm. and i thought that was such a beautiful feminist empowering classic movie and it's directed by a man so who's to say and then you know ridley scott also gave sigourney weaver the role in alien and alien and and, which was revolutionary so but but in answer to your question i just think part of it is let's go back you asked a couple questions one is that in the early part of my career yes it was an issue i would flip through the subscription season programs of theater companies in australia and i would say nothing in there for me uh, nothing in there for me. Uh, they're doing they're doing a Shakespeare. Nothing in there for me, and I it was really demoralising because I knew that they probably were not going to cast that way. Not because they were being overtly racist, but I just think maybe you know there's been this idea for a long time that it's really hard to find great Asian actors in Australia. That might have been the case at a certain point, but now we have a plethora, and uh, they're working. And, and I think now I don't have to agitate for it because it's already naturally happening. So, for example, I did a show called The Commons for the Stan Network and I was cast in the role of Harlow Mattel. And then I did a, a series several years ago with Rebecca Gibney and I played Detective Colin Basham. These are not Asian names, but they didn't change those names. I also last year did a, a feature film in a supporting role playing Bobby Berman, who's a New York Jew. And we kept the name as Bobby Berman and there was no reference to my Asianness. And I just, and because I researched that and I researched that there are Asian Americans living in New York who speak with a thick Bronx accent, just like there are Asians in the Mississippi Delta who speak with a full on Southern accent. And I researched that. So, so that, I love that, that that subverts the stereotype, but in this day and age, it's just becoming better and better. It's not perfect. We still have more work to do. But I think people like yourself, just by asking that question, just by being open, just by you talking to your colleagues and saying, hey, what about Charles Wu for that role? What about Monica Sayers for that role? Do you have you thought about if you know you know you've got a director friend and he or she is directing a production and and you're not gonna suggest them just because of their ethnicity. They also have to be able to deliver the job and be right for the character. But if you think they're great, then that that could help. Yeah, absolutely. Anthony, I think I could talk to you for hours and hours on end. I know. Uh, but um, we do have to sort of cut it off shortly. Is there anything that you would like to tell um, the listeners or the viewers? Um, how can they contact you to do uh, one-on-one coaching or uh, yes. even do your, uh, your course? 
Oh, thank you so much for that. Well, you can contact me on my email, which is Brandon Hero. So my second name, Anthony Brandon Wong. Brandon Hero, B-R-A-N-D-O-N-H-E-R-O at yahoo.com.au. That's one way, or you could try to find me on Facebook. Um, and the, the last thing I just want to say is what an incredible, as much as this is a painful and difficult and testing time, what an incredible opportunity to reinvent ourselves, to re-educate ourselves, to really, I mean, many people have said this, to really reconnect with what's important, to center ourselves to look at how our minds react in situations like this and take a step backwards. And, and just to remember the we thing, you know, we've had the me, me, me generation going forward. We can't do that anymore. As Brené Brown said, we don't want to return to the old normal. We want a new normal. And the new normal is much more compassion. And the role of the artist has to move. I mean, has to, it always, I believe this, but more so than ever, has to move from me, 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 me on the red carpet, me, look at me, to what can I do to save this freaking planet? Because that's what we're up for, climate change, yeah. all the things that we're dealing with. We have to shift from this me focus to a we focus and to use our singing and our dance and our acting and our art and our writing and our, and our films and storytelling and television to do that and theatre to do that. We Never more important. And what a great time to get ready for when we can be back in theatres, when we can be back on sets, to really um, bring our whole heart for the mission of the planet, not for the mission of ourselves. Absolutely. Wow. What a wonderful note to leave on. We'll leave it there. Thank you so much for being with me today. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen. Love you. Love you.